Welcome, travelers. You've found the storytelling room of Cosmic Roots and Eldritch Shores. Get yourself a cup of your favorite brew, settle in, and get ready for takeoff. Tonight we have The River's Daughter and the Gunslinger God, a fantasy story by Matthew Claxton. The river's daughter heard the new sounds in early spring, when the passes into the valley were still mantled in heavy snow. Booths crunched through rotten ice, and a voice cursed. The intrusion woke her in her little hut of birch and pine branches. She waded through the river, catching a fish in one hand for her breakfast, whispering thanks to her father as she bit into silver scales and white flesh. She clambered up the far side of the river bank and crept through the fern and huckleberry, her footsteps silent as the falling dew. The voice belonged to a dwarf, the hoofbeats to his red-eyed mule. He was an unlovely creature, with the pale grey skin of his kind, mouth set in a scowl, nose bulbous, teeth like granite. His foul temper was stamped on his features plainly. His clothes were as rough and work-worn as his hands and face, but the pistol he wore at his belt was a fine piece of craftsmanship, gleaming steel with a carved ivory grip. On one finger the dwarf wore a ring of gold that was as fair as anything to be found in the great cities of civilized lands. As the river's daughter followed him, the dwarf paused from time to time to draw air into his wide nostrils or bent to sip from the cold river. He followed the scent to a sandbar, and swirled a pan in the creek water. He ignored the glacial bite on his pale fingers, and kept swirling until he saw the bright gleam. His kind don't smile easily, and this dwarf less easily than most, but he allowed himself a satisfied grunt. He scooped out the gold dust with a calloused finger, and spread it across his tongue. He closed his eyes for a moment and let the cold metal work its way down his throat, into his guts, his blood, his marrow. He opened his eyes, and there was a glint of gold in the brown of his eyes. He packed up his gear and continued upstream into the valley. He had the taste of it in him now, the flavor of the gold, and he would find its source. The river's daughter followed. In the long age before the dwarf came through the pass, a giant had been struck down by the blows of a fellow immortal. The Jotun's death throes had gouged deep ravines, his flailing fingers had scraped out box canyons, his stony flesh had sloughed away as sand and gravel, his jagged, shattered bones had formed the mountains through which the dwarf had journeyed. At the far end of the valley his skull still loomed, a mountain topped by the cavernous cliffs of the dead Jotun's brows. In death the giant gave life to the valley, like a fallen tree that nourishes the forest. His sinews had mated like snakes. His skin had swollen to beget monsters, like man's flesh begets maggots. A great, motherless river roared out through his teeth, and the river in its turn had fathered its own children. The river's daughter had hair as long and green as eelgrass, and skin the livid white of a fish belly. Her teeth were sharp, and through her thin lips she sometimes whispered spells and curses, for her mother had been a sorceress. Since her mother's departure swathed in furs in the middle of a winter storm, the river's daughter had not seen a single outsider to the valley. She spoke to the winds and her siblings, the creeks, and she amused herself by practicing charms to change her shape. Spending a season as an otter, another as a bird, she had little past and less future. Destiny had put no stamp on her. This dwarf, this outsider who moved with such purpose, fascinated her. She watched him for days, from silent concealment in the forest. The dwarf's name was Brocker, and if he had vices... Sloth was not among them. He followed the taste of gold on his tongue to a bend in the river, and by a broad sandbar he made a tidy camp. 
while his red-eyed mule cropped the ferns and scanty grasses, he panned the gravel, up to his knees in the water, trout scattering as he flung away useless rock and sand. He found a dead tree, lightning-blackened, with a deep hollow at the base of its trunk. In the hole, Brocker stored his gold dust in tightly woven sacks. It was three weeks before Brocker realized that someone was watching him. He squinted his eyes and glared at the silent forest. His hand strayed to the butt of his pistol. The river's daughter rose from the ferns, head cocked to one side, arms slack. Brocker put down his hand. He laid his pan down on the gravel bar. Who are you, and what do you want here? I was born in this valley, the river's daughter said, in a voice like water coursing over stone. My father is the river over yonder. Who are you, and what do you want here? Brocker bristled at being challenged on his own claim. But he was civilized, and for all that his manners were rusty, they yet endured. A visitor, and one who would be your neighbor, Brocker said. May I offer the poor hospitality of my camp? They ate hardtack and drank coffee, and said little, neither being made for conversation. I'm called Brocker, said the dwarf, before she vanished back into the woods. What are you called? Sigrun she said. She returned each day. Sigrun stayed longer and longer, sitting on a fallen log, tin mug clasped in her hands, watching Brocker pan and shovel, watching him hammer together a sluice where a fast-rushing creek met the body of her father. She began to help him, guiding Brocker to the best sandbars, warning him of places where the river coiled around hidden snags, pointing where its richest beds lay. In his turn he gave her knowledge of tool and craft. While he built a sluice, he showed her how to hammer a nail straight, the use of plane and chisel, level and plumb bob and carpenter square. Along with the skills carried in hands, he taught her the charms and quiet words that shaped metal and wood. He could be gruff on the rare days when she did not immediately grasp his lessons, but he was not cruel. He would simply repeat himself, show her again, and guide her hands until she had caught the trick of the thing. She took to the new craft like a hawk to an open sky, and before long even the stern dwarf was forced to admit that she had learned well. Sigrun watched every day the care the dwarf took with his work, the way he combed out his mule and checked its hoofs, the way he grunted in satisfaction at a board cut straight and true. By inches, the river's daughter felt the flickering flame of fascination grow into a bonfire within her breast. The dwarf smiled at the gold in the bottom of his pan, and Sigrun smiled at him, and neither of them understood the depth of the other's infatuation. One day, Sigrun did not leave Brocker's camp. She went into the canvas tent with him, and lay beside him in the night. It was the dawn of summer when others began to trickle through the high passes around the valley. They came alone or in small bands, men and dwarves, elves and trolls, things with three heads or lashing tails, bald as ivory or furred like a bear. They dragged their supplies on barrows and drove teams of snorting oxen hauling heavy carts. The valley echoed with the sounds of saws and the crash of falling trees. The newcomers also took to the streams, and if their efforts were less fortunate than Brocker's, they were not fruitless. Gold came forth from the river and the stone, gold that had once flowed as blood in the Jotun's veins and salted his bones. By late summer there were three hardware stores, seven saloons, and two whorehouses in the valley clustered together less than an hour's walk from the cairns that marked Brocker's claim. "'I suppose it doesn't seem right that the first man in the valley should live in a tent,' Brocker said one evening, when the warm wind stirred the cottonwoods. The next day he began felling trees. The river's daughter helped him saw the planks and level the foundation. By the time the summer was at its height, the house was finished. 
It was a fine thing, oak-boned and roofed with fragrant red cedar shakes. The powerful words Brocker and Sigrun had bound to its beams made it proof against storm, against heavy ice or snow, against wrath and the gnawing teeth of vermin. But it was not finished until the day Brocker built window frames. Come, he said to Sigrun that evening. As the sun sank, he led her to a clearing, where he set the frames out on the soft meadow grasses and flowers. The sky was cloudless and bright with more stars than there are stories. Brocker spoke a few words and reached up with one rough hand to grasp at the sky. He tugged, and into his empty window frames he laid falling dew and starlight. He smoothed it and spoke to it and coaxed the cool, clear light into shape. Sigrun had caught the words, mouthed them silently along with Brocker. I'll try, she said, and she too poured a handful of silver light into a window frame. The glass was as clear as melt water. They set the windows into the house that night. Sigrun stayed up, Sigrun stayed up, until she saw the dawn break through glass for the first time. Winter fell on the valley like a wolf, and carried off those too weak or foolish to prepare. For a fortnight no one came through the pass. Anyone there should have been dead, a larder for the bears when they awoke come the spring. Yet the stranger appeared out of the howling gale. His buckboard was drawn by two black bison, the woolly hair of their backs clean of snow, bronze rings through their noses, madness in their eyes. The stranger wore a broad-brimmed hat and a long, fringed coat. The handles of his two pistols and the knife in his boot were carved from black horn. His skin was pale, his eyes black. He stabled his animals and walked into the nearest saloon and ordered a drink. He paid with an old coin, the portrait of a long-dead king worn to smooth anonymity. He produced more coins as he finished each drink, and he didn't get up from his stool for three days, exhausting the saloon's stock of whiskey one glass at a time. Then he moved on to the next bar. Word began to circulate that a god had entered the valley. The barman took his money. Everyone else gave him a wide berth. He's waiting for something, Brocker told Sigrun one night. When it comes, maybe he'll move on and leave us in peace. Something about the stranger bothered Brocker put an itch between his shoulder blades. She arrived in the spring with the first warm breeze. The woman alighted from the stage in the muddy thoroughfare before the Serpent's Head Hotel, and ferns sprang to life around the soles of her white boots. Her hair was bright as molten copper, her eyes the golden brown of wild honey. Her teeth were even and white, and they spread into a smile so glorious that the poor bellhop of the serpent's head fumbled the coin she dropped into his palm. He rushed out to get her bags, hands shaking, the faint floral scent of her skin working its way deep into his mind. When he died, five score years later, that scent would drift through his final dreams. The name she wrote in the hotel register was Incari and she said nothing about her business in the settlement, but went straight up to her rooms and closed the door. In a saloon at the far end of the muddy street, the stranger sat up in his chair and took in a heady lungful of air. He laid a coin on the counter and walked straight to the serpent's head. He marched up the stairs to Inkeri's room. He rapped on the door. She sent him away. Brocker heard the tale when he came to the town the following day to haggle for supplies. "'The dark-haired man, the one with the bison,' said the owner of the general store. "'Someone had the iron-blooded courage to send him packing. A woman!' Brocker grunted and grudgingly paid for his flour and lard and pickled cabbage. He was outside loading his supplies on the mule when the shutters of the serpent's head opened wide to let in the fine spring air." Incari turned away from the windows, and Brocker's glance caught her in profile, the curve of her brow and nose, lips and chin, 
He saw her reach up and unpin that copper hair and watched it fall down her back like a river of liquid fire from the earth's own heart. She moved away from the window then, and Brocker took a step forward, as if drawn on a line. He stood there for a long moment, dumbstruck. That night, while Sigrun slept at his side, and the moon poured light through the thin curtains of his fine home, Brocker fretted and tossed, and he arose having slept not at all. He returned to his diggings, and chipped away with pick and shovel. He sluiced the golden flakes and nuggets from the soil, and for the first time in his long life, the sight of gold could not fill the gnawing desire in his heart. By the fine house and the rich vein of his claim, Brocker built a forge. In the town, the nameless stranger returned each day to Incari's hotel room. He knocked and stood before the door until a servant opened it and gave him a single regretful shake of her head. The stranger stomped down the stairs, his boots burning holes in the carpet runner, his gaze hot enough to catch the hotel register alight. The staff of the serpent's head scattered or ducked behind the desk when he arrived, and when he left, they cleared up the damage. I wish she'd see him, muttered the hotel manager, who was no fool and feared worse to come. Gods, he said, there's no trouble like godly trouble. After nine days and nine refusals, the stranger hitched his bison to his buckboard and followed a rough track into the hills. His pistols were at his side, a long rifle slung behind his back, and chains and ropes coiled like snakes in the buckboard. When he returned that night, tethered to his wagon was a bear larger than any the settlement's inhabitants had ever seen. Its claws were like bayonets, its paws the size of skillets, and its heavy shoulders supported two monstrous heads. It was exhausted, breath heaving from its red mouths, tongues lolling. Two brass collars were set to chains leading to one leash. The stranger took the chain in hand and led the creature down the dusty main thoroughfare, as though he were taking a dog for a walk. Everyone passing by suddenly remembered pressing business that must take place behind closed and locked doors. The stranger stood in front of the serpent's head. Wordlessly, he raised the leash in offering. The curtains of Inkeri's room twitched open a finger width, then closed again. He stood there while the sun advanced across an eighth of the sky, but when there was no answer, he led the beast into the woods. There was a terrible roaring then, which no one was inclined to investigate. At dawn, the stranger visited the town baths and cleaned stinging black blood from his body. He dressed again in clean clothes. He drove his buckboard out of town. So it continued for another eight days. The stranger returned with animals, the likes of which few in the town had ever seen. On the second day he brought in a white stag with curling horns of solid bronze that knelt before the serpent's head as prettily as a trained pony. On the third he drew a leashed wolf with eight legs and black fangs dripping venom. On the fourth a snake as thick as a telegraph pole with a forked rattling tail. No wild prize, it seemed, was suitable for the woman who kept her rooms in the serpent's head. Each refusal enraged the stranger. The air stank of blood and magic. A young witch who had come to make her fortune at the card tables abruptly paid extra for the first stage ticket back out of the valley. You don't know the half of it she said when the bellhop at the serpent's head asked her if she'd seen something. There's more than him and her at play here. She tugged at the blindfold that covered her eyes and turned her face down the valley for a moment, then shuddered. At his claim, Brocker heard the howls and screams of strange beasts, but he paid them no mind. He hauled heavy beams and flagstones to build his forge. His sinews were strained and his hands bloody with ceaseless effort with axe and adze. From the upper windows of the house, Sigrun watched him. She had offered to help, and he had angrily refused. 
Finally the forge was ready, and Brocker stole to his hoard of gold by starlight and weighed out a precious store of dust. For three days he labored in his forge, and when he emerged he carried a round brooch. It was a circle of pure gold, gleaming and still warm as blood. Brocker stood on the porch of his home and blinked smoke-reddened eyes. Sigrun stepped onto the porch next to him, carrying a mug of strong coffee, and he took it without a word. He never took his eyes off the brooch. The circle of gold showed leaping trout and chinook, sleek otters, foaming rapids. The scales of the fish gleamed in the dawn light, achingly close to real. Sigrun stared at the brooch, entranced. Brocker had never made anything that wasn't useful. His craftsmanship was impeccable, but all the beauty in his house, in his tools, came from the clean lines of a thing well fitted for its task. He could no more have built an ugly house than he could have built a cold, drafty one. Yet here was the thing of great art as well as great craft. She reached out her slender hand, and Brocker finally met her eyes. No. He tucked the brooch in the pocket of his apron, and the light on the porch dimmed a little, that golden gleam hidden away. Sigrun let her hand drop to her side, limp. She searched Brocker's face and found nothing there. His eyes already sought the path that led towards town. He went inside, leaving Sigrun on the porch. When he emerged, he wore his newest clothes, clothes she had mended and cleaned for him, boots she had shined and left by the door of their bedroom. He walked past her without a word. In the river, trout leaped wildly, and the rapids lashed the stones and gravel. Sigrun's eyes were dry. She knew where Brocker was going. The winds of the valley had been her friends since childhood, and they had shared the gossip with her, the story of copper-haired Inkeri's arrival in town. Even the southern breeze had spoken of her beauty. The winds had also told of the black-clad man and his efforts to court and carry. He knew her of old, the winds whispered, and she knew him, and this was some long game played by immortals, which beings who were born and lived and died could scarce understand. Sigrun wrapped her arms around herself and shivered with rage and sorrow. She went back into the house, a house she had thought built for the two of them, but now she feared she was little more than another tool to Brocker. He fed and curried his mule, he cleaned mud from his picks and pans, he rubbed the gleaming steel of his pistol with oil and kept it clean. When he had a woman, he built a house and gave her its keys. Was there no more than that? She walked to the upper floor and stared out through the starlight windows, and she saw the scorched tree that concealed Brocker's hoard of gold. Sigrun's nails dug into the soft wood of the window sill. He was walking to his death, and in that moment a part of Sigrun dearly wished for the arrogant dwarf to bleed out into the mud. But he was the first man to have held her heart, unworthy vessel though he had proven. An instant later Sigrun was gone, and a small grey bird sat on the window sill. It fluttered into the sky. Brocker caught himself on the stairs of the Serpent's Head Hotel, his course uncertain for the first time in many a year. He drew the brooch out from the pocket of his jacket and felt its weight, the smooth, fine features of the work, and it seemed to him the merest trash to lay before the woman. But it was all he had, and he could make nothing finer. Brocker steeled himself and took the stairs at a steady pace and rapped on the door. A servant girl peered out and demanded to know his business. A gift for your mistress, Brocker said, and he held up the brooch like a talisman. I'll give it to her, said the girl. Brocker's arm drew back. It'll go into no hand but hers, he said. Even in the dim light of the corridor, the girl could see the shine of the thing, feel the heat of forge and magic still radiating from it. She nodded and shut the door. Incari stood there when it next opened. 
Brocker stammered out some rough greeting while she smiled serenely. Then he thrust the brooch at her. She took it, her fine white fingers brushing his coarse, calloused ones for a brief second. He barely heard her prettily worded thanks, the suggestion that perhaps they might run into one another in the tea room downstairs some day, the entirely polite dismissal as she had pressing appointments. The door closed, and Brocker found himself standing in the street, mouth hanging open like a dog's on a hot day. In the distant woods, hunched over the spoor of an elk, the stranger smelled coal smoke, hot metal, and the reek of the forge, and behind that, a fine floral scent. He ran to his wagon. In a fury, he lashed his bison to a gallop, heading back to town. The coffin-maker perked up his ears at the first gunshot. He allowed himself a feral smile. Business had been slow, what with folk leaving town. Those who remained spoke politely, drank alone, and played cards honestly, all of which was bad for his business. But the second shot was louder than the first, the third louder still, and the fourth a thunderous crash like the cleaving of mountains. Wood splintered, Men and women and animals screamed. The coffin-maker ran to the window in time to see the façade of a saloon collapse into the street, a pile of splinters. Standing in front of the ruined building was the stranger, a smoking pistol in each hand. Bleeding drunks pulled themselves from the rubble and fled. A shattered table shifted, and from under it came a dwarf, the one from down the river who scowled at everyone like he had the toothache. A gun was in his hand. The stranger waited. He still had bullets in his guns, and the coffin-maker judged that one of them would finish off this dwarf and then some. We'll bury him in a matchbox. That'll be how much is left of him, muttered the coffin-maker. But the god in the broad-brimmed hat stood stock still, pistols at his side. He smiled, as if at last he had found some true sport and he did not want it to be over too soon. Brocker raised his gun, but Sigrun had been standing on the top floor of the livery, whispering charms her mother taught her, mingled with prayers and pleas to her father. The river had burst its banks upstream from the town and flung itself down the thoroughfare, tearing away porches and painted signs, picking up wagon wheels and water troughs, saddles and stones and mud and logs. All of them struck the god with the force of the spring freshet, the time when the snow melts and flings itself at the sea with all the abandon of first love. The god could stand against bullets and jotuns, but the river was another matter. He was swept away, gone in an instant. Brocker stood before a wall of water, jaw slack, he looked up at the livery and met Sigrun's eyes as the wave receded and left the street a muddy slough. The dwarf holstered his pistol. He looked down the street. The manager was fleeing the serpent's head, a bellhop on the back of his horse, a carpet bag of cash slung next to the saddle. The buildings that had not been destroyed by the god's gunfire and the flood were smoking, threatening an inferno. Somewhere in a pile of refuse down near the livery, the god was buried in shattered timbers. On the upper floors of the serpent's head, Brocker saw the light catch on copper tresses for an instant. The curtains twitched back. He started down what was left of the street and turned his face away from the river's daughter. In the distance, the river rumbled. The coffin-maker was sensibly leaving before he had need of his own wares. He had packed his money and saddled his mare and was urging her for the pass. He rode past the serpent's head and saw the two women looking at one another, the green-haired witch on the livery roof, the copper-haired woman on the hotel's porch. King Carey's servant girl was loading baggage onto the last stage out of town. "'You should stay to see how it comes out,' said Sigrun, a challenge in her voice. "'See if your man kills mine or mine yours.' He's not my man, King Carey said. Nor is the other one yours, I think. 
Sigrun was too proud to let her hurt show. And I know how it turns out, Inkeri said. It's happened a hundred times, in a hundred lands. It always ends the same. Sigrun shrugged. Your man's killed a lot of folks, I expect, but he might find Brocker tougher than he supposes. The corners of Inkeri's mouth twitched. She stepped down off the porch and onto the mud. Mountain flowers sprang up around her boots, a whole season's growth in seconds. They withered and died just as fast, petals scattering on the breeze. He'll die, a bullet in his belly, Inkeri said, calm as if she was discussing the weather. We all play our roles. I ain't playing, Sigrun said. But you have played, a bit part, Inkeri said. Shall I tell you your future? No. You will rule this valley. You will be its witch queen, its forest hag, lurking in the shadows of the pines, wise and terrible. Your kin, the Jotuns, will come, seeking knowledge of the worlds beyond death, and you will give it to them, dragging wisdom from the cold places beneath the bones of the earth. You will live long and wax powerful, but you will never know love again. Sigrun felt the woman's words trying to grab hold of her, like burrs greedy for purchase. Are you sure, ma'am? Sigrun said. Because you can't catch me in a false prophecy. Not here, not in my valley. Sigrun vanished for a moment and a bird fluttered down to the street, and then the river's daughter stood before the goddess heavy square-toed boots inches from delicate calfskin. Maybe you just want to snare me into a story because you hate what you can't have. Inkeri's lips curled in a fair imitation of a smile. You envy me, Sigrun said. The way stone envies fire. I'll die, but I can make my own way. You play the same part over and over, courted but never caught. Always followed, always refusing. You must get tired, lonely, just playing your game, watching us mortals die, waiting for the end of all things. In Carrie's mouth was a thin line. She began to speak, but Sigrun held up a hand. Anger mingled with sudden pity in the heart of the river's daughter. Shall I tell your future? Sigrun's voice filled with old power from her sorceress mother and the stone bones of her Jotun grandfather, hot in her very marrow. Before the world burns to a cinder, he'll catch you, or you'll slip away. You'll have your heart's desire, or you'll weep until you're wrung clean out. But the long chase will end, and you'll have a chance to make your own choice. The power went out of Sigrun. The goddess looked at her, and something in those perfect empty eyes flickered. Fear or hope or both together like close-growing pines. Inkeri climbed into the carriage, and the driver flicked the reins. A moment later, Sigrun was gone too. A grey bird fluttered away into the smoky chaos. It was midday by the time Brocker reached his claim. The fine house was gone. Its timbers and cedar-shake roof were a waterlogged jumble amid the pines. Its starlight windows were smashed to pieces, the shards shrinking, turning to curls of silver mist in the sunlight. The forge, built of thicker timbers, still stood, but its roof was torn apart, silt and gravel ankle-deep on the floor. Brocker trembled, let go of the mule's lead and ran to the lightning-struck tree, the tree had toppled. The hollow beneath it had been scoured clean. Not a speck of gold remained. My father is quick to anger in the spring, said Sigrun. She stepped from behind a fir tree, quiet as a fawn. You did this, Broker said. Sigrun shook her head. Why did you interfere, he snapped. Thought you might like to live through the day. She held out one hand, in invitation and forgiveness. Come with me. We can go away. Build another house, somewhere far from here, hidden. 
but he turned and looked at the distant dust cloud raised by departing horses and mules and wagons. His eyes sought for Inkeri. Then he glared at the hollow tree, emptied of the gold that could have adorned the copper-tressed woman. What gifts could he bring her now? I'll not be chased out of this valley without my gold, Brocker said. Not by a foolish girl. And this sliced the last strands of affection binding Sigrun to him. You'll take your mule and leave. Brocker clenched his fists in fury, wishing to unleash them on Sigrun, but even fired with rage, he feared the moment after that, the rush of vengeful water. I can dig it free again, he said. I can build again. Sigrun shook her head. He'll come for you, Brocker. He's dead, the dwarf spat. No, he's a god. Even my father couldn't kill a god. Even I couldn't. He'll whisper your name to the winds. Send them seeking for you across plains and mountains. He'll speak to the streams, ask if you've drunk from their waters. He'll find you. I can beat him, Brocker said. He grasped the butt of his pistol. I made this gun. The bullets are the first gold I ever mined. I etched them with runes, powerful charms to fly true, find the heart's blood and drink deep to the death. Maybe, Sigrun said. Maybe you can even take away Inkeri and lock her in a tower and keep her for a time, but not here. She held her chin high, but no hurt showed in her eyes. I should never have taken you to my bed, the dwarf said, his words sour as vinegar. I should never have given you the hospitality of my fire. Your fire? Your bed? The pines shook, and the ground trembled beneath them. This is my valley, my home, my birthright. Brocker braced himself as Sigrun opened her mouth, waiting for a curse to fly and find him. But Sigrun lowered her hands and looked away. I lay no spell on your head, Sigrun said. Nothing I could do is worse than what you've brought on yourself. Brocker nodded grimly. He salvaged what tools he could, bridled his mule, and started walking. Sigrun turned away before he was out of sight. When he was gone, she cried at last. She wondered that she had been such a fool and wiped tears from her eyes. The south wind rustled her long winding hair and wrapped itself around her shoulders like a shawl. The valley was empty again. Ferns pushed up through the blackened rubble of the town. When winter came, sluices collapsed under the weight of snow. The river rose and washed away the bones of men killed for the love of gold. Sigrun retreated to her hut, cleaned out the cobwebs and dust, and slept again on the bed she had built for herself. She added a few tools, pots and pans, knives, a hatchet. Over her bed she hung a long saw, and at night she whispered the words Brocker had taught her for shaping wood and metal and calling down starlight. She thought of staying, of letting in Carrie's prophecy come true. Witch of the woods, prophet of the pine forests. She could make that life her own, but summer brought the creak of ox-cart axles in the pass, and Sigrun found herself pacing the ridgelines, looking out over distant peaks. The valley felt too small to share again. By the time the first prospectors waded into the creeks, Sigrun was gone. She left upriver, leaping the rapids in the skin of an otter, flying overhead on grey-feathered wings. In her own shape, she walked past the skull of her grandfather, skirting the cliffs of his cheekbones, a pack on her back. Maybe Inkeri's prophecy would still catch hold of her and draw her back to the valley. Maybe she would never know love, but she would craft her own tale before she returned. The End This has been The River's Daughter and the Gunslinger God by Matthew Claxton. Matthew Claxton is a reporter 
whose career has allowed him to encounter magicians, con artists, philanthropists, lemurs, robots, stunt pilots, mounties, live bears, and politicians. His stories have previously appeared in Asimov's Science Fiction and Mothership Zeta. He lives near Vancouver, British Columbia. To discuss The River's Daughter and the Gunslinger God, please visit the forums at CosmicRootsAndEldridgeShores.com. For more stories like this, click subscribe here and on our website. Your subscription will let us bring you more stories, illustrations and articles, and support writers and artists. Thanks for joining us on the journey. We'll see you next time.